All right. Well, it's about 11 a.m. our time. Good morning. Um, and thank you for joining us to learn more about our Desert Tortoise Hatch Lake Head Start program. If we haven't been introduced yet, my name is Lizzie and I am the Education Program Supervisor at the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens. And this morning I'll be in tandem with Jenny Lynn Robinson, your webinar facilitators. Um, we are joined by members of the Living Desert and by San Diego Zoo's conservation teams. They'll be answering some questions today to spread information and awareness about this project and about what you can do to help. Just some quick webinar etiquette. We ask that you please mute your mic if you're not speaking. And you are welcome to use the chat feature at any time to type out questions for our panelists. And then we'll designate some time for your questions to be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, and with that, I will let our panelists introduce themselves. We'll have Lou go first. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Lou, so I'm an assistant conservation scientist at the Living Desert. So I'm in the conservation department and I head the Desert Tortoise Adoption Program here. So I'll be talking to you today about all the many hatchlings that we've now acquired for the time being. Uh, also from the Living Deserts Conservation Team, we have Lexi. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Lexi Beatty. I'm one of the assistant conservation biologists here at the Living Desert. I also help and assist Lou with all of the care for the hatchlings. Um, and also coordinate any uh, visits along with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, the conservation team here. Jumping over to the San Diego team, Melissa Merrick. Thanks, Lizzie. Hey, everybody. My name is Melissa Merrick. I'm Associate Director in Recovery Ecology at, in the Department of Conservation Science and Wildlife Health at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. We also have Tom Radzio. Tom, I'm sorry, I think you're still muted. Fantastic, thank you. My name is Tom Radzio. I'm a researcher with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, also working within the Conservation and Wildlife Health Department on the Head Start project, where we focus on head starting the animals and conducting research to better understand how to protect the species. Tally Hammond. Hi, I'm Tally Hammond. I'm a scientist with the Desert Tortoise Program at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And I work with uh, Melissa and Tom and others on this call who you'll meet shortly. Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, I am a senior research associate and do a lot of the field work. And Reed Newman. Hi, I'm Reed Newman. Um, I uh, work primarily with Daniel in the field doing the um, tracking and monitoring the desert tortoises. And then last but not least, we also have Misty Hailstone from the Edwards Air Force Base here with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Misty Hailstone and I am one of the wildlife biologists that work out at Edwards Air Force Base, helping to manage all the natural resources. Great, so a huge breadth of knowledge and experience for us to learn from this morning. Uh, the first question we have, can you tell us a little bit about the desert tortoise and its conservation status? And what challenges is the desert tortoise currently facing? This is open to anyone. I guess I can start off a little bit. Um, right now, the desert tortoise is listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. It's endangered in California, and the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List has it listed as, as critically endangered. And some of the reasons for that is because it's the species, the Mojave Desert Tortoise, has experienced significant declines over the last 20 to 30 years. And so right now in all of the critical habitat units where it's monitored carefully, 
most of the populations over 75% are below what is considered viable for population sustainability. And so that's, that's a big concern because we don't have enough adults on the landscape to produce young animals. And we're really not finding any of the youngsters on the landscape that actually survive into adulthood. And I don't know if anybody else wants to talk about some of the threats or. I can chime in and say a little bit about some of the most common threats that desert tortoises are facing right now. Um, so some of the ones that our program focus on, focuses on are uh, subsidized predators. So these are predators that aren't invasive species or introduced species, but they are species that have learned to thrive in association with human settlements and human resources. And those that predate upon tortoises include the raven and uh, coyotes as well. And so we see a lot of raven and coyote um, or other candid predation, predation in the field. And that's one big issue um, we're trying to ameliorate. And we can talk a little more about that later. Other major threats for this species include roads, um, both paved roads and um, dirt roads and off-road vehicle use habitat degradation and loss, um, including dumping, uh, development, again, roads, fragmentation, uh, and then all of the threats that are associated with climate change. These can include an increase in extreme weather events, drought, wildfire, um, and that wildfire factor is also linked to an increase in invasive plant species in tortoise habitat. And I probably missed, sadly, some of the other threats, but those are the, those are the ones at the top of our list. Anyone else feel free to chime in with others. Yeah, we focus a lot on ravens as a subsidized predator, even though they are, you know, a native species, their population is just boomed with all the extra resources that we're giving them with trash, water runoff, you know, they're super smart birds. I went for a run a couple days ago and I saw three ravens in trash cans in my own neighborhood before I even left. And I was like, no. So they're definitely smart. They can learn how to get in those lids if they're not all the way closed. Um, yeah, going off of what you were also saying, Tally, just being out in the field and seeing how many invasive like Mediterranean grasses are coming up. And if that's all these tortoises can find to eat, then that's a big problem because I know research has shown that not only can those plants not have as much nutrients and be as nutrient dense as some of our native species, but they can actually be harmful for the tortoises to be foraging on. So if that's all they're finding and increasing this fire hazard, then it kind of just becomes a twofold problem that just kind of snowballs. Yeah, and because the young tortoises have so many predators, it's really important that they grow rapidly. So when they grow slowly, they spend more time at small sizes and more time vulnerable to predators. And that contributes to fewer animals making it to adulthood. Exactly. It's, it's unfortunate that they're such an easy target for ravens because their shells don't harden until they're roughly about five years old. Um, so something like what we're doing with this head starting project, I think will be hopefully show, um, hopefully allow that these juvenile tortoises that we're working with to avoid some of these like high mortality rates that they usually do face in those first couple of years of life. That's a perfect transition, Lexi. Um, so here we are, um, our multi-facility collaboration. We care about the desert tortoise and we wanna work to protect them from some of those threats that Tally and Melissa and Lou were talking about. Um, so would anyone mind giving us an overview of this Save the Desert Tortoise collaboration um, and what is the goal of this project? What are we doing? And why is it so important? I wondered if Misty might want to start giving us sort of a historical perspective of the, the Head Start program that's been going on for a long time at Edwards Air Force Base. And we've come in uh, recently to that program, but there's a, there's a longer history uh, of Head Starting work that's been going on. Yeah, um, head starting has been going on on Edwards for a really long time. Um, we are one of the original uh, facilities that started head starting tortoises. 
Um, we've been really lucky in that we've been, we've had a lot of collaboration in the past with various researchers. Um, so our facilities were actually made um, or put together, they were module units. Um, they were originally put together in about 2002 and the first females were brought in in 2003. So yeah, we, we've been going strong ever since. Um, and like I said, we've had collaborations with different universities. Um, we started with UCLA. We've worked with um, different contractors. We've also worked with um, USGS and now the San Diego Zoo Alliance. Um, and through this various process over the years, we're just learning more and more about what it actually takes to raise uh, tortoises that will survive in the wild. Um, not only the, the health of the tortoises, but also what habitats and um, what dangers it is that, that we can prevent in order for them to be successful. Um, this includes inside the pens and our holding facilities as well as out in the wild. Um, I think we found that there's a lot more dangers to these little guys than anyone ever really expected. Um, nobody really knew the extent until, until we started. So it's been really a learning process. Um, luckily there are other facilities and other people that have also been doing this work. So we've also been able to collaborate and learn from their experiences as well. So. so just in case anybody isn't familiar with the term head starting. Um, does anyone mind giving a quick little definition? Sure, I can jump in on that unless anybody else wants to wants to take it. So really what it is, is having animals in human managed care during a time where they are most vulnerable. And often that's the youngest age class of animals. Sometimes it's the egg stage. Sometimes it's the uh, hatchling stage or, or juvenile stage, um, but basically by keeping them protected during their most vulnerable stages, it gives them a head start in life, meaning that they are they, they kind of skip or can fast forward through the, the life stage where they might be experience, they might experience the most predation in the wild. So we can release animals into the wild uh, in a at an age class where they're a little less vulnerable. And we have some slides that we can show you of what we're talking about so you can get an idea of how small these guys are. So it's kind of hard to see scale in the photo, but these are about the size that the hatchlings are now. Um, they come to us as an egg, they start out about golf ball size. So when they hatch, they're still, still pretty tiny. So these rocks to us would just look like very small pebbles, but to these tortoises, they're huge, huge boulders in there with them. So Great. definitely need a good head start. <laughs> yes, those, those boulders are great for climbing over or they like to think. <laughs> And Lou, where did the eggs come from? Yeah, so the eggs were brought to us by San Diego. Um, so I don't know if you all want to tell a little bit more about how you even ended up with the eggs before they got here, if you want to go chronologically or if you want me to just jump in. Yeah, we can. We can talk about that. I, I guess um, I didn't know if we fully answered um, Lizzie's first question about the head starting aspect, um, or do you want to jump ahead a little bit? I think um, if we can relate head starting um, the goal to the goal of this project and to what the process of this project looks like, we can knock all three topics out. <laughs> Sure. Well, I'll just build on what Misty was saying about the, the history of the Head Start program at Edwards Air Force Base and, and sort of the reason why we are 
continuing to do Head Start work and have been fortunate enough to partner with Edwards Air Force Base for the use of their excellent facilities. And one of the things that we know is that, you know, there aren't very many young and young tortoises on the landscape. And so we're trying to make, get them past their most vulnerable st stage and then release them on the landscape so that hopefully there will be more young that will contribute to the future breeding gener the, the future generations of breeding age tortoises in, in you know, maybe 20 years. Um, but one of the things that we wanna make sure that we understand is that we're putting animals on the landscape in places where they actually will survive. And one of the things that is important in that respect is to understand what are the micro habitat features, because these guys are very tiny, uh, what are the micro habitat features that promote survival? And so we're looking at fine scale features on the landscape, such as burrows, which you can see in the, the picture on of uh, the tortoise kind of resting in its burrow facing out on your screen. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is the shrub cover, number of small mammal burrows, because those are super important for, for these hatchling or juvenile tortoises and prom to pr promote survival, especially when we know that these pr predators are increasing on the landscape and understanding what the predator pressure is and how we can help animals get, you know, not be so vulnerable to predation. And so once we understand what are some of the best habitat features that promote young tortoise survival, we can understand what where might be the best places to put young animals on the landscape. So we're not just releasing them in places where they may not do very good. And when we're thinking about development, future development in the desert, a lot of times developers have to select mitigation parcels that offset the land that was lost to development. And we wanna make sure that the parcels that are put into conservation are better than the, if hopefully better than the ones that were selected for development. And so that's just to give a little bit of perspective about some of the questions that we're asking in, in our work with uh, our collaboration with the, with the Living Desert Edwards Air Force Base and our Head Start program. And obviously there's so many questions that we can we can get to about what some of the things that we're hoping to learn. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. But the reason why we have our animals at the living desert right now and why they came a little bit early in the form of eggs, which we weren't expecting, is that uh, right around Labor Day, there was an extended heat wave in the Mojave Desert where temperatures were above 110 degrees for over 10 days. And this coincided with a time period where the hatchlings were most vulnerable to these temperature effects. They were just emerging from the nest. So some nests were beginning to hatch and some hatchlings were just emerging on the surface. And they're still learning about their world. And so they're, they're trying to find their own burrow or the place, place where they might be successful. Um, and they're in a managed care environment. So they they don't have as many options to find a burrow that they might have if they were completely in the wild. And we were noticing that they were, the substrate temperatures were just at the critical limit that was, was risking them being too hot. And so we worked with partners at Edwards Air Force Base, the Living Desert, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the US, United States, States Geological Survey, in addition to our veterinary uh, specialists and uh, curators here at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And we discussed the situation with them. We tried to mitigate uh, the temperatures with shade cloths and extra burrows and, and watering the substrate to cool the temperatures down. But ultimately we felt that the temperatures were just gonna be too risky. And so we all came together to work overnight to excavate the remaining nests and transport all hatchlings and eggs to the living desert one month ahead of schedule so that they could rear them in a temperature controlled environment and to make sure that they uh, had their best chance of survival. And so that's why we had both eggs and hatchlings come to the living desert. We were expecting only hatchlings to be coming to the living desert this week, but uh, the, the temperatures really forced our hand with that situation, but it's been a wonderful collaboration and we, we can't thank the Living Desert enough for all of their hard work. Yeah, so on, on our end, we were a little bit surprised to end up getting eggs. <laughs> we were expecting all these hatchlings um, and it was great. San Diego brought us incubators and we had some awesome protocols still set up from previous time when we had done a collaboration like this. So we were 
well equipped to be able to take them. But yeah, it was good, good to be able to do that on short notice. And luckily we at the Living Desert have some very knowledgeable vet staff here who have worked with tortoises and turtles in the past, um, as well as some amazing animal care keepers. So this, this partnership has mostly been through the conservation department, but we're lucky enough to have desert tortoises here on grounds with us as well. So we have some other great members of our animal care team who are able to help answer questions that pop up for us with things that maybe we haven't seen before, maybe like specific behaviors or even how do we make sure that we aren't getting ants in this area or random things like that. So they've been a great resource for us to have our animal care and our vet staff team. Um, yeah, so we we got I think around 30, 30 eggs and hatchlings the first the first go around, which we weren't expecting. And then yeah, a little bit later we ended up getting more hatchlings. Um, so now we're we're close to 70 now. But we overnight evacuation because those temperatures were just yeah, so hot. And you can see on the images here, some of the eggs are starting to hatch and when Hatchlings are coming out of their eggs. They're still very soft. So in the picture in the middle, you can see one tortoise still kind of closed over in that fold on his stomach, down on his plastron is what we call that part of the shell. Um, it's still folded over because he's just, just unfolding from his egg. So they're still incredibly soft at that point. So the tortoises have been, the hatchlings and the eggs have been emergency evacuated. They've arrived at the living desert. What's next for them? And are there any specific head starting strategies or tactics that we're going to be using while they're here? I guess I can start with that and then we can have other folks chime in about some of the, some of the different strategies of, of research questions that we hope to address. But, you know, recent studies by lots of different uh, researchers from University of California, Davis, the Savannah River Ecology Lab, and the United States Geological Service um, have discovered that a hybrid rearing approach, which, or a combo rearing approach, which involves a period of time where tortoises are reared indoors under, under lights uh, all winter long. And then a second period where they live outside before release actually results in animals that are a little bit larger upon release and the same amount of time. So the same amount of time with the tortoise was reared outdoors versus reared with a combo of indoor and outdoor rearing. Tortoises grow about twice as fast and their shells are actually harder upon release. And it was found that these individuals also don't move as far from the release site. So um, that's important because when anim that's one of the biggest challenges with conservation translocations is when you release animals, they move away from the place that you put them. And that means that when they're moving in search of some new place, they're more vulnerable, vulnerable to lots of different threats like predation. And so the hope with any conservation translocation is that animals are anchored to the site um, that you put them. And one of the ways that we hope to do that is by picking the very best sites for release, but also animals that have experienced this combination of indoor and outdoor rearing maybe because they're a little bit bigger, um, they tend to not move away from the release site as, as far, and so they have higher survival. And so that's, that's, the, that's the reason why we were trying this in, indoor-outdoor combo rearing approach with our, this current round of Head Starting, which is funded by United States Fish and Wildlife Service Recovery Challenge Grant. And so we've been working with the Living Desert to make these plans for quite some time. So we will have cohorts coming in in 2022 and another cohort next year in 2023 that will have the same 
approach. And the reason for this indoor rearing during their first winter is normally in the wild, these, these hatchlings would stay in their burrow. It would be cold, there isn't any food. So they would stay in their burrow all winter, meaning that they wouldn't have any light and they wouldn't have any food or taking on nutrients. And so they really don't grow very much. Whereas in this case with this combo approach during their first winter, they do not brumate or go in their burrow during the winter. They're active and eating and growing that entire time. So they actually can be twice as large as, an, as a juvenile that was reared outdoors only. And I'll turn it over to others to talk about some of the goals of this indoor period. Yeah, so on our end, when both the hatchlings and the eggs that um, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance uh, transported to us. We had them set up in this room that you can see on your screens here to the right, this photo on the right. So this is where they're all currently residing. Um, and on our end, it's very important that this controlled facility stays controlled. So we are keeping track of not only the temperature of the UV lamps and the heat lamps that are directly on the hatchlings, but also the temperature of the room, um, as well as going in and monitoring how, what humidity is um, being emitted in these little tiny humidity hides that kind of look like makeshift to-go containers, but they serve their purpose well. Um, that is something that is like a little makeshift burrow, an area for the hatchlings to go inside when they need to cool down. Um, so we also keep track of exactly what the humidity level in those hides are and everything is tracked and monitored and um, uh, written down by Lou and I to make sure that the hatchlings are getting the correct appropriate temperatures that they need in order to be growing to ideally the size of a two-year-old. Um, and on the same wavelength, it's the same thing with food. So the greens and the um, these little, forgetting the name, I think it's a Mez Curry desert tortoise pellet, kind of looks like dog food actually, um, but they love it. They were actually fed this morning and they, you should see how they descend and swarm the minute we put the, um, feeding trays in their mesocombs, in their tubs. They, um, so on that same wavelength, we also are measuring and making sure that they get access to greens and to food for a certain determined period um, based on some research papers ahead of time, but it, they get fed um, the entire six hour period. So it doesn't get taken away. Uh, it gets, they, they can come and go as they please in terms of feeding. So hopefully with all this access to this abundance of resources that um, they will grow to an ideal size before, uh, an ideal size before they are um, re-released or rather brought back to Edwards Air Force Base and then re-released. Yeah, and you can see in the pictures here too, they get natural substrates that helps with their muscles, being able to crawl over all those rocks and over each other, which they also seem to very much enjoy. Um, making sure that they build nice strong muscles in their legs so that they can go out, dig their own burrows, can travel, you know, good distances. Um, we have a lot of people because they are viewable to the public. So when people come to the living desert, they can see the hatchlings. And a lot of times people see them upside down on their shell, which can be quite scary because you can see them kind of flailing around. And in the wild, it is a tactic that males a lot of times will use. So they'll use this part of their shell called the guler horn, which is right underneath their neck. You can kind of see it in the picture behind me. Um, on males, it's quite large and they can use that to flip each other over. So with our hatchlings, we try to make sure that there's a good amount of rock, um, some divots in the substrate, but they're learning how to flip themselves back over. That way they can do it on their own. So if they're ever in a precarious situation like that, they can flip themselves. So definitely looks a little scary. And we have lots of great concerned guests letting us know that our tortoises have flipped over, but they are getting nice and strong and learning how to do that on their own. 
they are doing exactly what they should be doing. <laughs> yes. Practicing. So. Are there any other protocols being used to ensure that the hatchlings are equipped for life on their own once they are re-released? So the tortoises will actually have a transmitter when they get big enough <clears throat> and we will be tracking them uh, throughout their lifestyle. <clears throat> Yeah, there's a few other studies that we'll be doing too once they're transferred back to Edwards Air Force Base, but also um, even while they're still at the living desert. One of the things a number of people have touched upon is the fact that um, A, there aren't a lot of these little guys out in the wild uh, because of some of the threats that we've discussed, including subsidized predators. And B, even if there were a lot of them out there, it's really hard to find them. They're, as you can see in the pictures, like about the size of a golf ball and you've got the whole Mojave Desert to look in. It's really tricky to, to find these tiny little animals. And so in addition to being really a critical method for helping to save the tortoise, head starting is also an opportunity for us to learn more about this really unknown life stage for this species. And so some of the studies we'll be doing um, while the animals are at uh, the living desert is really to just collect some pretty basic data, but data that are unknown about how juvenile tortoises interact with each other. Uh, we'll also be doing some studies on um, thermal physiology, and I want to hand it over to Tom to talk a little bit about some of that work, and then I can I can talk about a bit of the work we're going to do at the, at the outdoor pens at Edwards. And Tom, you're muted. Sure, so temperature affects so many aspects of the lives of these animals. Uh, unlike small mammals or other uh, warm-blooded animals, their body temperatures are gonna be the temperature of their environment. So that affects their ability to walk around. When they're cool, they can't walk very fast. They might not be able to turn themselves over very fast. It affects their ability to digest their food and a number of other things. And it also affects their preferences for where they like to live and where they might have highest survival. So. It all starts from very basic elements, like Tally was saying, to try to understand what are the normal preferences of the animals. And we're really well equipped to do that in the uh, managed care situation because we have, can expose them to cool temperatures and warm temperatures within their containers and see which ones they prefer. And then try to relate that to other aspects of their biology. Again, like digestion or growth or preference for certain habitats in, in the field. Um, then when they're released, we are able to continue to monitor those type of, those type of uh, temperatures and other things in different environments and to try to understand um, that as, a, as part of their suite of habitat preferences. Tom, relatedly, I just happened to see a question in the chat about um, sex determination in tortoises and how that relates to temperature. Could you say a little bit about that? Sure. So when nests are warm, they tend to produce more females. When nests are cool, they tend to produce more males. So in the middle month of incubation, incubation takes about three months. And in the middle 30 days, if the nest happens to be warm, you will produce more females. If it happens to be cool, you'll produce more males. And in general, if it's an intermediate temperature, you'll produce a mixed clutch of males and females. And so the location where the female will lay her nest, either outside the burrow or inside the burrow can influence the sex of her eggs as can the overall climate of an area, which can be impacted by where they happen to live, what part of the desert, but also it can change in time um, on a long scale with climate change or with the occurrence of heat waves. So we try to understand um, that aspect of their biology too. Initially, more females could be good for tortoise populations, we think, and other turtles uh, by producing more animals that can reproduce. But once you get beyond a certain threshold, and have a large number of females, much larger than the number of males, then you can start to see deleterious effects. So initially there could be a positive, um, but long-term there could be a negative from, from warming. But warming can happen in many different ways. It can also happen based upon where you release animals. So that's part of what we're doing too, is trying to understand our thermal habitat and that informs proper release sites for, for head started animals. And then just to go back to Lizzie's original question, and then I'll hand it off to someone else. Um, there's a few other things that we're doing to try to set up these animals for success in the wild. 
Um, and some of the studies will happen once they're in the outdoor uh, enclosures at Edwards Air Force Base that Misty was talking about. Um, so even if tortoises weren't facing a subsidized uh, predator issue in the wild, head started animals across taxonomic groups tend to deal poorly with predation. And part of that may just be because they don't have the life experience um, to know what predators even are. They've kind of been raised with like a silver spoon uh, in a, a very stress-free world. And so one of the studies we want to do while these animals are in their, their outdoor portion of their hybrid rearing is to try to train them to recognize that predators are something that they should be afraid of. Um, and so we will be doing some studies using raven related cues and uh, coyote related cues to try to train animals uh, that, uh, again, to avoid predators. And um, we'll be doing this in an experimental framework. So we'll have a control group that doesn't get the training and a trained group that gets the training. And once they go out into the wild, um, which Daniel is talking a little bit about, uh, we will be able to monitor them and look at if there are any survival or behavioral differences between this trained and untrained group. Thank you uh, so much. If, oh. uh, if I can just real quickly take it back to what Tom was talking about with um, the uh, temperature uh, dependent um, uh, uh, genders for the tortoises, uh, I'd seen another question that was asking actually about our specific heat wave um, that caused us to take our um, tortoises up out of the ground early and bring them to the living desert. And uh, they had asked if the temp if those temperatures would um, likely have affected uh, the gender determination of of our hatchlings. And as Tom had mentioned, uh, as when he was talking about it, um, it's really the middle month where those temperatures will affect the 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 genders of the hatchlings. So because this was happening at the very end of their um, you know their time uh, before hatching. Uh, it's unlikely that this particular heat wave would af affect their gender determination. Um, mostly we were concerned about, you know, the survival of the eggs and the hatchlings with this increased heat. And that was sort of the, the most important thing there. I will also follow up with that. One of the things that we're working with um, at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, we have a, a department of, re uh, of um, reproductive sciences. And we're going to try to uh, do some hormonal assays. There's been a few recent studies that have shown that hatchlings around the four to eight month age mark uh, start to differentiate uh, their sex in terms of testosterone levels. So even though they might sh not show any external secondary sexual characteristics for 10 to 12 years, um, you can uh, look at sex differences uh, with hormone assays and looking at testosterone levels. And so we're going to try to do that uh, with with these uh, with these hatchlings and 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 our cohorts going forward to actually see what the 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 the, the breakdown between males and females are um, in our cohorts. That's and great. This, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I was just going to say there was a question in the chat, and and maybe Daniel or Reed want to talk about the transmitter that was on the tortoise. And the question was, how are the transmitters adhered, and does it hurt the tortoise? Uh, no, it doesn't hurt the tortoise. Um, it's basically a epoxy um, that stick that binds to the shell really nice, <clears throat> and it is a little difficult to get off, but it's doable it, and it does not hurt the animal at all. Uh, one thing that we definitely do try to make sure we do when we're applying those transmitters is um, to try to make sure our, our epoxy or whatever adhesive we're using is only in contact with the central part of the tortoise's scoot. Um, if you take a look at the image that's here on, should be up on the screen right now. You can see that large bulb is where the transmitter is, and we try, uh, you know, as as best we can, not to get any of the adhesive or the epoxy on the margins, uh, between, you know, that separate the scoots. Because if the adhesive or the epoxy gets into that area, it can restrict the growth um, of the the tortoise's shell, um, which is definitely something we don't want to do. 
Um, but as long as we're able to do that and make sure that um, it's only really in contact with the central part of the, the scoot, um, there aren't, there shouldn't really be any sort of lasting, you know, um, harm uh, in that way. Just to clarify for people who don't know, so the scoot is kind of like the polygon shaped part of the shell. So each of those pieces is called a scoot and the kind of rings or gaps in between the scoots are where their growth plates are. So that's where they're actually getting those lines and growing more. And then we also, image, oh, go ahead Tom. In that image, you see the, the big bulb in the front and then two other scoots with some epoxy on them. And what you have there is little tunnels in the epoxy made of tubing that allow the antenna to move when the animal grows. So if you came back and looked at this animal uh, a little bit later, you would see more distance uh, between those um, pieces of epoxy that are able to move independently as it grows. So even though you have epoxy and an antenna going across three scutes, it's able to move as the animal grows. And as we put on or take off any of the transmitters, we do a full health assessment on the animal. So if we do see anything that might cause a problem, we will move the transmitter to uh, the other side of the animal. So yes, we do lots of weights, we do lots of measurements, an overall health assessment to make sure the animal is, is doing well. Daniel, one of the questions in the chat and I know we, we we can take questions at the end too, but they're just sort of related to the conversation that, that's that's happening right now is um, about screening for disease at the time. Do we, one of the things that, that you look for is signs of disease, correct? Yes, that's correct. We, we look for any kind of uh, lesions or any kind of sickness of any type and we record that. Uh, and that gets put into a database so that we can go back and, uh, do research with. Can you all explain maybe what's going on um, in some of the pictures here? So you're talking about screening for health. Um, it also looks like someone got to wear a really cool apron while checking out these tortoises. I don't know if you all could speak to what what's going on on these. <laughs> I can speak to the cool apron. So uh, is the What's happening in that picture is this is there's an adult female tortoise that's being that's being radiographed in the field. And um, Tim Tim Alvey is the is the apron wearer and the x-ray operator. And so that's just a safety measure to to make sure that no negative effects of radiation are 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 incurred upon his body. And obviously I would be getting out of the way in the, it, it, before he would actually take the x-ray. But underneath the tortoise that's being placed in the container is, is a digital x-ray plate. And so this is a new x-ray system that we have, we're, we are using collaboratively with the veterinary hospital at San Diego Zoo. And it's completely digital, which means that no longer do we have the old x-ray cassettes with the film inside that we have to wait, uh, take to, uh, somewhere to process and then wait to see the images. There's a laptop, which you can see behind me with a, as soon as the x-ray is uh, collected, the image shows up right there on the laptop. It's, it's uh, Bluetooth connected to, to the, the plate. And so we can actually see the uh, eggs, uh, if the tortoise has eggs or not, it shows up really well in an x-ray. And so we monitor the females in the field until the x-ray demonstrates that the eggs are of a certain thickness. And as the eggs develop, the, the shell gets thicker and thicker. And so at some point, uh, very, at, at a level of thickness that's predetermined, we bring the female into the Head Start facility at Edwards Air Force Base where she can lay her eggs. And then while they're in the Head Start facility, we continue to x-ray them at, at every week. And as soon as they show that they no longer have eggs, they are released at their exact point of capture in the wild. Tally, maybe wanna talk about what's going on in the lower left? Sure, so that's another uh, behavioral study that we're working on. And so that little waiting pool, which is actually designed as a, a waiting pool for like golden retrievers and large dogs to splash around in when it gets hot is uh, what we use as a behavioral arena. 
And so in that photo, um, we have an adult female tortoise in the arena uh, and we film these trials and uh, assay different behavioral traits of the moms. And so the idea is that um, different, different individuals might consistently exhibit different patterns of behavior in that arena. For instance, some might move around more and be really active and try to escape. Some might be more willing to insert their heads into these tiny little holes that we've inserted in the walls. And we'll also include novel objects um, in the arena. So things that the tortoises might never have been exposed to, like a rubber ducky, and look at how they respond to those objects because many organisms have an inherent built-in uh, neophobia, so a fear of new things. And uh, this is a trait that can vary across individuals. And we can then look at how these behavioral traits relate to behaviors and success in the field. And what we're specifically interested in, since one of our big focuses is on the juveniles, is whether maternal behaviors and juvenile behaviors are linked and whether juveniles with particular personality traits do better or worse after translocation into the wild. So for instance, uh, you, if you have a more bold exploratory juvenile animal, they might be more likely to find a burrow and find success. Or conversely, they might be more likely to expose themselves to predation and, and get eaten. And so these are, um, this is kind of a, a smaller component of our work, but something that uh, could be, provide some interesting insights into whether we can use behavior or personality traits to actually predict how animals will do after a translocation event. That's so interesting. Um, similarly, uh, we do have some questions about behavior and training, um, specifically when it comes to training the hatchlings to recognize predators. Um, so somebody asked, what cues are we using to train the hatchlings to recognize predators? Maybe are we pairing the coyote slash raven cue with something negative? I can tackle this one again if no one else wants to. Um, so yeah, this is like if you took a, a Psych 101 class, this is your classic negative reinforcement training. So we're pairing a negative aversive cue uh, with a predator related cue. And so um, for the, the coyotes, it'll be coyote urine, um, possibly paired with a stuffed coyote going by the animals. This is a study that's gonna be happening a number of months from now. So we're still working out the exact details, but you can actually buy coyote urine online. Um, and so that's something we'll be using as the predator cue. And uh, for ravens, it'll be probably more of a flyover event with a stuffed raven, um, possibly paired with raven calls. Um, and then for the aversive cue, uh, what's been used in the past for these sorts of experiments with tortoises is, is flipping the animal temporarily. This is something that they don't like um, and that can be really risky, uh, but it's also another, another thing we're still kind of working out the exact methods for. So. Uh, We'll, we'll keep you updated about that as that study progresses. Um, and then another question that I actually have when I first heard about this um, project from someone who doesn't have a background in biology. One of our primary messages here at the Living Desert regarding desert tortoises is that desert tortoises who are in human care stay in human care. They should not be re-released. Um, and then conversely, desert tortoises who are in the wild should stay wild. Um, so would anyone mind sharing why these tortoises are different um, and they're, they're crossing that threshold? Um, and if there are any special precautions being taken? Yeah, so we were lucky enough to where, you know, a lot of them were able to hatch out in the wild naturally. Some of them, like we were saying earlier, did have to get brought in, but they stay completely separate from any of the other animals here at TLD. So we have some pretty strict protocols going in with foot baths and gloves, um, disinfectants and different cleaning methods to make sure that we're not taking any sorts of you know, bacteria or fungus or stuff like that in or out of even the room that they're in. So making sure that everything is just super clean. So one of the problems with animals from human care going back out into the wild is they'll get this upper respiratory disease and it can still be a little unclear of 
where animals get that. And when they're in human care, usually because they're getting such good care, the symptoms aren't even there. So we don't always know that they have it. And you might think you have a healthy tortoise and oh, you're gonna release it, which has plenty of problems on its own, even without having an upper respiratory disease. And then that disease can get transmitted to wild populations where they're under a lot more stress from their environment, trying to find food, mates, all those things. And so the symptoms from that disease can be a lot more extreme. Um, but even that animals that have you know, been in human care, like these hatchlings, or we're providing food right now, we provide water. They don't get full access to water all the time. So that is something that they would be experiencing you know, out in the desert, not always having water, only having food for limited times, but we are still providing that for them. So while they're here, they are getting a little bit pampered and animals that would be in human care would be experiencing that all the time. So them being able to go out and then forage on their own can be pretty tricky. But the nice thing about having these hatchlings for only a short time is we're hoping we can get them big enough to give them a good chance, but we're also not having them long enough to where they're getting super used and accustomed to being treated you know, like they are a pet to where they're having all their resources just handed to them. And the nice thing too about having the space up at Edwards Air Force Base is once they're done their six months here growing, they get to go back out into the desert and they're still in somewhat controlled environments where they're, you know, being able to experience the range of temperatures, reacclimate to being in the desert, but we're still able to keep them a bit more safe from predators. So we're kind of giving them baby steps to get reacclimated to being let go. Exactly. And um, to build off of what Lou had said, when um, we are caring for the tortoises here in the lab at TLD, at the Living Desert, um, we are trying to be as hands-off as possible. So the only handling that is done um, is something that would be absolutely necessary, such as monthly weighings or monthly um, or, or weekly soakings. So it's very minimal. It's not, there's no petting or anything that you might be doing with a pet at home. Um, it's strictly trying to keep it as hands off as possible. We also wear gloves and we also wear masks whenever we are going into the space with them um, just to make sure that everything is being as um, clean and as sanitized as possible for the juvenile hatchlings. Thank you. Um, another question since I can assume that everybody here cares about desert tortoises and wants to participate in their conservation. Um, what would you recommend for how the general public can support either this project or desert tortoises more generally? What can they do at home? We can, yeah, kind of one we had talked about earlier is keeping your trash cans closed. <laughs> um, TLD has a time to talk trash campaign that we love to share with everyone. So if people can make sure that their dumpster lids are closed, you don't have trash flying around, you know, at your house, really anywhere you go, you know, picking up trash that you see because those, you know, flashy wrappers or empty food containers that can catch a bird's eye or a coyote. You know, those animals have gotten really good at living close by people and learning that we provide all these extra resources. And so they're good at being able to pick out when they can get those resources and what they look like because they can learn so fast. So we really try to get people to pick up their trash to make sure that they're well contained. Um, even if it's not your trash, anyone can go out and pick up trash and we love, love that. Um, Another thing would be, yeah, planting native plants. So we can help, you know, a whole big range of different native species by planting native, native plants. And if we can help get those seeds out there and dispersing, helping pollinators, helping, you know, other small mammals, just the entire food web is so connected that anything small starting ecosystem just 
magnifies by the time it gets up to larger species. So if we can start with those native plants to start supporting entire ecosystems, then that just has an entire you know, wave effect throughout the ecosystems that we're in. And another way that the public can help is when people are going out into nature and going on wonderful hikes as the weather starts to hopefully cool down here in the desert, um, is to leaving um, any tortoises you might find out in the wild, leaving them alone, being hands off. Um, they know where they're supposed to be and they will get themselves there. And also just staying on trails that are designated for us and keeping your dogs on leashes. That, that really helps um, the desert tortoise and just keeping, yes, keeping, leaving desert tortoises alone when you are out enjoying the beautiful nature um, is one of the best ways that you can admire and enjoy, um, hopefully the desert tortoise for years to come. Some of the other kind of conservation actions that everybody can 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 do their part is maintaining, you know, when you're out in the desert, traveling only on designated routes, and don't make new routes into the desert. If you if you enjoy off road vehicle uh, use, um, it's really important to stay on designated routes at appropriate speeds because we do lose a lot of tortoises, even adults, to vehicle collisions and. You know, when you take out just one tortoise, it may not seem like a very big deal because it's just one animal, but these animals, because they're so long lived, um, taking out one adult female can have drastic Im uh, impacts, negative impacts on, on the, the future population of the area and any recovery efforts that are going on. So that's really important too. And checking under your vehicle before you leave because tortoises sometimes will sit under your vehicles to get shade. And so before you before you leave, when you park somewhere in the desert, always make sure to check under your vehicle. Thank you. Um, anything else that any of our panelists would like people to know about this project or about conservation efforts regarding desert tortoises? Any last comments before we transition to the Q&A. Um, just one other action item, being loud against climate change. So writing to any you know, local officials or government, you know, making sure that your voice is heard and that you're out there advocating to make sure that we're taking necessary precautions really helps. Um, as Tom and Reed were talking about, these guys are super temperature sensitive. So making sure that we keep you know, part of their habitat is being able to access their habitat, which is temperature dependent. So they really require that we all do our part to make sure that it's safe for them to come out of their burrows, to forage, to find mates, to do what they need to do. So. I just want to echo what Lou said. I think, you know, as much as we're, we're trying to do right now um, for these desert tortoises and as much work goes into head starting and raising them and releasing them and monitoring them really um, probably there's nothing stronger that any of us can do than to use our voices to uh, advocate for this species and other endangered species in the context of a whole landscape of, of human source threats, including climate change. And really the biggest way to make a difference for any of these things is to kind of have a, a cultural change um, and to yeah, inspire people to, to care about their local backyard wildlife. I couldn't agree with what Tally said more. And I hope that this webinar is demonstrating sort of, you know, the, the really deep conservation actions that zoological organizations have and sort of the things that go on behind the scenes that you may not see as much of when you visit each organization, but by visiting zoos and aquarium, you really are having a big, you are really contributing to conservation of species that are in your own backyard and across the world. So um, I hope that this has sort of been a, a nice shining light on some of the conservation work that goes on at, at local organizations and, and 
you know, everybody is supporting it by visiting them. Yes, and if you would like to become even more involved during your visit, um, if you are so inspired, um, consider becoming a volunteer and donating your time. Um, we have a large volunteer cohort here at the Living Desert, and some of them even work with Lou and Lexi directly. Well, we have reached the hour mark. Um, and if there are no other final remarks, um, well, I'm okay to wrap up this webinar. Thank you everyone again for your time, those who joined and asked questions, those who were interested in this project, and of course our, our panelists. Thanks, Lizzie. And I also, the, the questions that, that we didn't get to, um, I wonder could, is there a way to answer them and, and make them available or do you, is there a process for that? I don't know. Jenny, what do you think? Um, I don't know if we have contact information for everyone who submitted a question. I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. If you're available to stay on for a few more minutes, Melissa, um, answering those questions, I mean, we can definitely keep the webinar open so people can get those questions answered. Um, yeah, if, if that's an option for you to stay for just a few more minutes. Sure, yeah, I, I also wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I just, I've just been trying to type in some answers as, as we go, but um, obviously I didn't, we didn't have a chance to answer all of them, but um, they're, they've been great questions and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to, to hang out with you all and, and chat today. Sure. Um, well, then in being mindful of everyone's time, if you have to leave, we understand. If you do not have to leave, you're welcome to stay and we can um, transition into the Q&A now. Um, so the first question I see on here is probably for Lou and Lexi. Uh, what temperatures are we keeping the hatchlings at inside during the winter to keep them from brew mating? So they get a pretty nice range. Um, so they have some basking lights that give them some different UV lengths as well as heat. So underneath their super hot lights, they can be anywhere from like 35 degrees Celsius on the warm end to 27, 24 degrees Celsius on the cool end. So we give them a nice gradient so they can kind of choose how hot they want to be. Um, we see it a lot in human care where people will keep them too hot and then they can get dehydrated, which leads to things like bladder stones. So we like to give them a range where they can stay in an area that's nice and warm, but where they can also head to the other side, their mesocomb, cool off a little bit, and retain a bit more water. So we give them that gradient where they can choose. Thanks, Lou. Um, our next question is a bit more general. While these little cuties are learning to be wild, what efforts are out there to reduce the challenges that they will meet? That's a tough one. There are so many. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, yeah, the, so, some of the biggest challenges uh, that we've discussed in, in this in this presentation have you know been the subsidized predator aspect um, and there's active work being done by both uh, you know getting the word out and understanding the role that you know human subsidies like trash and pet food and extra water left out uh, play into like supporting uh, extra large robust populations of like coyotes and ravens. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also has a, a, a range-wide raven monitoring program where at specific times of year they go out and they measure raven densities um, across all the critical habitat units for desert tortoises in the Mojave. And that gives us an idea of where 
you know, which, which units are having the most uh, problems with Ravens. And then if they have, they have some Raven removal uh, projects that are going on, particularly oiling nests of Ravens. And so they, by applying oil over the eggs, the eggs basically suffocate and die. So um, the, the parents are not successful successfully reproducing more ravens or uh, bringing more ravens onto the landscape. And so this constant range-wide monitoring of raven densities also gives us an idea of how well those raven uh, removal projects are, are doing. Um, so that's one of the things that's going on. Some of the other things to, to minimize road impacts is there's a lot of tortoise fencing that you might see on the landscape, uh, across, especially across uh, areas where tortoises are most likely to try to move or next to roads that receive a lot of traffic. You might see these short fences that are uh, below regular fences and those are tortoise fences that that help help keep tortoises off the roads and out of the way of, of, of vehicles. Yeah, Misty, I don't know if you're still here, but to put you on the spot, I don't know if there's anything on the base that you guys specifically do to help um, yeah, help you guys live alongside tortoises that you're seeing out there. Yeah, so at Birds Air Force Base, we do a lot <clears throat> because the desert tortoises are only um, federally listed species that lives on the base year round. Um, so one of the things that we really try to do is we focus a lot on education. Everyone that comes onto the base learns a little bit about desert tortoises and why it's important to um, conserve them and um, why we have certain restrictions on the base. Um, so some of those restrictions is things like off-road vehicle use. Uh, we have designated areas and specific trails that people have to use. Um, we, for every ground disturbing project that happens on the base, uh, we go through NEPA process, which basically is a, an environmental review of every project to make sure that whatever project is going on, we're minimizing the impact to the natural environment. Um, in addition to that, we do uh, trash education and monitoring from around the base. We have a lot of different partnerships, including with the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service to look at ravens and potential control of raven populations. Um, we monitor our base population of desert tortoises. We have signage on roads in densely uh, tortoise populated areas to again, help increase that awareness of tortoises. And we work with a lot of regional partners as well because you know, protecting desert tortoises is not a one organization, a one landowner um, effort. It's really going to require everyone on a regional basis to work together to try to recover the species because they do span quite a bit of land and they are very long lived animals and really important to our ecosystem. And if you as a, a member of the public are interested in learning a little bit more about desert tortoise mitigation and the current projects that are going on, um, part of the reason for this webinar is we are celebrating Desert Tortoise Week. Um, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service has put together a whole program of events. Um, so if you just Google USFW Desert Tortoise Week and then click on the schedule of events, um, you can take a look at some of the efforts that are going on near you and possibly even join one this week. Another question from the Q&A. Do you all know what species of desert tortoises are found in Borrego Springs? Is that area part of their natural range? This might be a question for Google, but does anybody know? Yeah, I think Brago Springs would be the same, the same species that we have out here. So I'm going to completely butcher the name if I try to say it, but it's go for a starts with an A. As someone else want to take over? <laughs> Agazizii. It's called Agazizii. Yeah, so the same desert tortoise that we have here in the in the valley in Coachella Valley would be the same one that you're having or seeing down there in Brago Springs. And they have super huge, 
you know, historical range. So it wouldn't be surprising to see tortoises all over Southern California. And then I think our second to last question, do y'all know of any impending legislation or mitigation plan to deter ATV driving in tortoise areas? That's a good question. Misty, do you, do you know, I can, I know that at some of the, there's been some presentations at the Desert Tortoise Council that, you know, biologists are actively working with uh, ATV enthusiast groups to try to, you know, join forces in making, uh, you know, everyone aware of desert tortoise conservation, but also making sure that routes are placed in place in areas where they're not going to impact desert tortoises. Yeah, well, I mean, as far as legislation goes, I'm not aware of any specific legislation um, in regards to ATV use. Um, different land ownerships usually have different rules and regulations about um, off-road vehicle use. So some land is specifically designated for that. Um, there's a lot of BLM land uh, that's designated for that. It's a little bit more restricted in some other federal lands. Um, and then state has their own rules and counties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're speaking to illegal off-road vehicle use, um, then again, it's, it's one of those regional efforts, I believe, um, as far as educating the public about why it's really important to stay on designated trails in designated areas because they are having an impact um, on our local wildlife, including the desert tortoise. So a lot of times you'll see signage, um, you'll see fencing as mentioned earlier, um, but it's really a matter of, of interacting with the public. And then our last question um, is specifically in regards to the bacteria that Lou was mentioning that tortoises in human care can pick up and transmit. Are we disinfecting the egg surfaces? When we're taking care of the hatchlings? Yeah, so everywhere that the hatchlings go or touch while they're here, definitely been disinfected. Um, because a lot of the eggs were hatched just naturally out in the desert. Obviously that sand wasn't disinfected, but it's not like that sand is quote unquote dirty. So they're being, you know, hatched in a natural substrate, a natural habitat where they're getting the bacteria that's already there in the ground. And a lot of that bacteria is really helpful for them. So we don't want to kill any of the bacteria that could really be useful for them while they're in an egg. But yes, once they come to the living desert, every every inch of the room that they're in right now has definitely been disinfected and cleaned. So anything that they're experiencing now in their, in their habitats has been screened. And I would, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna add that we also will rotate out certain um, like the substrates that are in the tubs that we saw, a picture of one in the um, picture of the room on one of the slides. It's yeah, this one. So in these tubs, um, this substrate gets rotated out monthly, so it is cleaned. Um, it'll be you know removed of any fecal, anything, and also the tubs will be disinfected afterwards. Even though those same hatchlings will be going back into that the the tub they were in everything is kept pretty clean in there and disinfected in between um, uses we also wash our hands or sanitize <laughs> between handling any um, any hatchling and anything we touch afterwards yeah i was also just going to follow up that it's it's standard practice to always wear wear gloves in between handling uh, among a, amongst a clutch or within the tub. And then also in the wild, all animals are handled with gloves. The eggs were handled with gloves that are changed out 
um, between clutches and we do really pay attention to not mixing any populations of tortoises and want to be mindful of that as well so um, they you know we are aware of this the, the risk of spreading any diseases and you know as Lexi and Lou pointed out also when anybody goes in or out of the tortoise room there are foot baths for disinfecting so that that is that area is is basically self-contained with respect to any other tortoises that are on collection or or in the wild near the living desert. I'm excited to watch them grow up healthy and strong. Okay, and we've reached the end of our Q and A. Um, I'll open the floor up again. Any final closing remarks? I just want to say thanks. Uh, we're really looking forward to watching them grow big and strong. Thanks, thanks to all the efforts of the Living Desert. Yes, and thanks to all of the hard work you guys have put in beforehand and prior to the hatchlings actually arriving at the Living Desert. Um, all of those late nights you guys pulled <laughs> extracting. But uh, one final thing I wanted to let people know on the chat if they didn't all, or on the call if they didn't already, um, these hatchlings are available to be seen by the public. They are in our vet hospital um, and you can come down to the living desert and see them for the next couple months. So make sure you do so because they will only be here until the spring. So you should come look at them while you can because they're pretty cute. <laughs> and then we'll do it all again next fall. Well, hopefully yes. <laughs> they will they will come in as as hatchlings and and not eggs and hatchlings. Yes, yes. Hopefully no major heat wave will change our plans again. And thank you to everyone who stayed on longer to listen to us answer your questions and also to Edwards Air Force Base for doing such an awesome job monitoring the females that are out there and letting us come in, use some of those spaces for outdoor rearing. Yeah, all the different partners involved. It's been great and it's been a wonderful experience working together so far. So we're excited to continue doing this and see how their behavioral trials go and what we can learn from them in the future. Yes, thank you everybody for your time, um, for your interest, for your caring. And then I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a great desert tortoise week.